This is the loneliest animal on earth. His name is Jorge the Lona, and he lives here on the Galapagos Islands. The reason for his nickname is that all others of his species have died. He is the only one left. Jorge is an example of the importance for all living beings of relations with others. Since the beginning of life in the sea, adaptation has taught animals to establish relationships with other beings. Over millions of years, driven by the idea that united we stand, many complex associations have been formed. No one on the planet wants to be forever alone, and all animals surround themselves with more or less complex social structures to increase the chances of survival. The great herds of herbivores start by searching for food together while they defend themselves from predators. But relations become more complex when it is necessary to establish a hierarchy and rules governing communal life. In addition, these bonds are further complicated by sexual reproduction, which implies the need to form couples and take care of the offspring. And this makes it both more possible and more necessary to develop social intelligence. Groups become more complex in order to defend themselves, but also to attack. Many fangs together can bring down larger prey, but that makes it necessary to be organized, to communicate, recognize each other and share the meat. And conflicts need to be resolved as far as possible without killing each other. Our life depends on it. The human mind has created bonds even beyond the real world, seeking to communicate with superior beings who can help us explain the thousands of questions posed by our enormous brains. It is these relationships that have enabled mankind to colonize the entire Earth, turning hominization into humanization and making the biological, cultural and environmental aspects inseparable. But let's start at the beginning. This is an albatross. Since it was born, it has spent seven years flying and fishing out on the ocean. And now it feeds the irresistible urge to return to this island called Hispaniola, on which it came into the world. It needs to find a lifelong mate, a bond which may last for 50 years, so it's important to make the right choice. The males arrive first and wait. When they meet, a complex ritual begins, their way of demonstrating a commitment to sharing their genes till death do us part. Though it looks that way, this is not a combat between rivals, but rather the courtship of animals with inexpressive faces who have to communicate through body gestures. Shortly afterwards, the grooming behavior consolidates the fundamental and simplest bond between living beings, the couple. But some animals have developed reproductive strategies in which stable relationships play no part. Here in Patagonia, Argentina, sex is a rather more violent affair.
This male elephant seal weighs 2,500 kilos. He is capable of copulating with 100 females in a single season, whether they want to or not. He has fought hard to win this beach, and he won't keep it for long. All of the females must have his children, so there's no time for seduction. Very few achieve such a privilege. He is a grade one male, and all the females want big, strong children like him. He will not be able to eat and barely sleeps because other males will constantly try to rape one of his females. And that means he will have to fight. If the warning doesn't work and the invader persists, he will have to show him precisely why he is king of the beach. For the females, a short rest before continuing. This is called polygyny, and for the females, the evident sexual conflict is a guarantee of both the quantity and quality of descendants. A biological pact which benefits both sides. In the majority of cases, life is more risky for the males because they either succeed or fail, whereas almost all the females breed. That is why evolution has made the males bigger and more aggressive. It is the female who must choose the best genes because her eggs are few, limited and valuable, and what's more, it is they who will have to look after the young. For a male, the cost of an error is insignificant. His sperm can easily be replaced. In humans, for example, a woman produces just 400 eggs in her entire life, but a man releases 300 million sperm in each ejaculation. The megalanic penguin is colonial and monogamous, so while some males are with their lifelong mate, others, still single, try to find a partner. But it is not easy. While others triumph, he is scorned. Despite the insistence of this male, the female rejects him because he does not have his own hole in which to lay the eggs. No way is she going to risk reproducing with someone who is not even capable of getting there in time to grab a decent home. And without a home sweet home, the girl simply isn't interested, no matter how much he insists. For the female, it is very important that the future father of her eggs has his own living quarters. So if this male wants a mate, he'll just have to get here a bit earlier next year. Almost all animals have one breeding season a year, but there are two species for which this is not true, rats and humans. Human females are always sexually active, and childhood is long, so the couple needs to be a stable unit. And that is of enormous biological importance because it is vital for the survival of the young. This is Papua, New Guinea, and in the highlands, a marriage is taking place. The bride shows off the money the groom has paid, in addition to 30 pigs. The bride and groom are from different villages, and now the two families are gathered together, 
the bride price can be handed over. In all human cultures, the union of the couple also involves the families and the clans. Without the support of their social groups, a new family would get off to a very bad start. Once the deal has been made, the bride's family takes their share of the food and goes to their village. The longevity of humans means there can be prolonged contact between generations, favoring a lasting biosocial and mental evolution. After the formation of the couple and a result of this, reproduction brings the birth of new individuals. For the majority of mammals, the adaptive success of the males is based on breeding with many females, then giving little or no help in raising the young. So the females are often left to look after the children alone. This female bear has to teach her two cubs how to fish for salmon, but at the same time must avoid any encounter with a male who would not hesitate to kill her cubs, so she would again come into heat. The cubs would not be able to survive in the future without the lessons they learn from their mother during the first three years of life. During this time, even their own fathers would not recognize them and would kill them. The maternal bond is without a doubt the strongest in nature. Any mammalian mother would give her life to save her children and would be capable of facing any danger for them. She is a super animal, ready to sacrifice all. But if she died, the young would not last long, so evolution is on the side of mothers who know when to beat a hasty retreat. A male is fishing rather too close, so it's best to leave. The elephant seals are not exactly model fathers either. In their obsession with defending their harem, these colossi push, press, and even crush the young who, as the almighty sultan rushes past, are often separated from their mother and get lost. They are the pups born the previous year, and they will continue to breastfeed for four more weeks before their mothers go into heat and are again mounted by the stud male. Up to 10% of cubs are killed, crushed by their father. In humans, generations live in close contact for many years, and the brain development of the child is based on psychological, social and emotional stimuli from his or her peers. The Himbas are a matriarchal culture in Namibia. Though they are nomads, their strong culture goes with them wherever they go. The young Himbas observe and absorb their own identity as a people. These girls have the plates which indicate they are still immature, but today they have a dream. 
The village is celebrating the fact that one of the girls has had her first period and her plates have finally been cut off. Not one of these girls, however, but rather an elder sister. These two can hardly wait for the time when they too will wear the decorations signifying womanhood and everyone will dance in their honor. The proud mother will continue to work until her younger daughter celebrates that important day. Afterwards, the three will follow the example of their grandmother, who has already churned the milk in so many camps and knows the importance of cultural identity for a Himba woman. On the other side of the world, in the Mongolian taiga, the Satan people are well aware of the effects forced acculturation can have on people. They are called the reindeer people. Their nomadic, independent life means they constantly move between Russia and Siberia. With the arrival of socialism in the region, the state took their reindeer off them, banned their religion, gave them a salary and appointed a commissary to impose fines for practicing ancient customs. Vets came and replaced the traditional ways of treating animals. Now the vets have gone, but the Satan have forgotten their traditional medicine, and so the animals die. From when they are young, the children must learn the jobs necessary to survive in such a harsh climate. Here, more than anywhere, their home is their castle. Inside the tipi, as in the case of the Himbas, the youngest absorb the culture through contact with their elders. For humans, the grandparents play an important role. It has been demonstrated that they offer a very different perspective from their parents and provide the children's not yet fully formed brains with examples of serenity and calm. Often the man and wife must invest considerable efforts in obtaining the elements necessary for daily survival, such as this cradle of birch, which the father is making for the new member of the clan. For this reason, it is important they all remain together as long as possible. That is the key to human progress, the family. <laughs> Cultural defense of the family may also have developed as a way of safeguarding its important biological function to successfully raise a new generation. Other types of bonds, as in the case of the anemones and the clownfish, bring such total dependence that what began as an advantage can turn into a problem. These fish no longer how to live without the anemones. Other relations between species may become as sinister as this. The gannets form breeding colonies here in the Galapagos Islands, but there is an additional problem to the ones all parents encounter. Above them on the cliffs live their worst enemies who have come here precisely to feed on the meat of the young. The frigate birds coordinate their own breeding with that of the gannets with the sole aim of feeding their chicks with those of the other species. From the time they lay their eggs, the gannet couples live a life of constant stress. The black gargoyles above keep watch even as they engage in courtship rituals, checking on the gannet colony, which is their own personal larder. With the future below and terror above, the bond of life and the bond of death go hand in hand in this perverse relationship in which there can only be one winner.
This is the Ivory Coast along the Atlantic coast of Africa. Here, the culture of the Dan will illustrate what man's next step was in his search for sacred bonds with supernatural beings. The members of these secret societies are the only ones allowed to have contact with the masks, which represent the protective spirits of each family. The initiated and the clan chiefs establish a complicity with them which goes beyond conventional bonds. is the birthplace of humanity. In the shadow of these mountains, we came down from the trees, and our brain developed until we asked ourselves what lies beyond the rivers and the forests. It is here that the music which transports us to heaven was born. Above the couple, the family, the clan and the tribe, the protective spirits whose origins lie in dreams and nature herself provide spiritual peace and strength to accept certain sacrifices of life which without them would be inexplicable. In the end, human beings seek self-awareness by building bridges with those who went before. And the question immediately presents itself. Where are they? In the jungle, in the sky, or in the sea? But it is comforting to think they protect us, watch over us, and can help us, though for that it is necessary to invoke them. Few places illustrate this calling up of the dead so vividly as Haishi, the birthplace of voodoo. The slaves, torn from their cultures, adopted new doctrines from the whites, but beneath this their ancestral rites always remained. From the combination of the two and the wish to avenge a miserable life, magic arose, the rituals which would finally rid them of their white oppressors. Death became an ally, and the transition from one state to another became possible, provided you follow the necessary ritual precepts. Frustrated at the problems of life, man looked beyond death for the answers and, as vehicles for this journey, chose other animals inventing the concept of sacrifice, which we could define as killing an animal not in order to eat it, the antithesis of the origin of everything. The voodoo ceremony rises to a pitch of ecstasy. They are now approaching what they will call the crossing, the place where the material and the spiritual world is It may be that after all, Jorge, the loner, is better off unaware of his condition. He will continue to court females of other species in the impossible hope that someday one of them will accept him. <laughs> <laughs> 